Good evening. You're watching Think Tech Asia. I'm David Day, and this evening we're going to be talking about organized crime in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, this is a subject uh, that is a little bit sensitive, a little bit touchy, and I want you to stay with us because later in the show we'll take the broad picture of organized crime in the region and we'll bring it to a focus. And for those of you who are watching uh, this program or listening to this program, here in the Hawaiian Islands, we will talk a little bit about organized crime and gangs here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, and to help us with this discussion, uh, we have the former special agent in charge of the FBI here for the Honolulu region, Charles Goodwin, otherwise David? known as Charlie to me. That's right. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go, we're gonna evening, go with Charlie. As usual, glad to be here. <laughs> Great to have you again. And also with us, uh, former uh, U.S. diplomat uh, with the State Department is Mr. Grant Newsham. And Grant, nice to have you back with us again. Well, thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen, let's get started with a discussion uh, about organized crime in the Asia Pacific region with a topic that uh, maybe some of our viewers have seen a little bit about, they, they know a little bit about, or they think they know a little bit about. Let's, let's talk about organized crime in Japan just to kind of get started. Let's, let's focus on the Yakuza. And uh, what we'll do in, in this, this conversation is we'll bring, up a, we'll bring up some pictures for you to talk about and kind of the significance of that. And so uh, let's us get started with that, uh, talking about organized crime. And so uh, this picture here, we've got uh, a, a, a series of tattooed gentlemen. And, and maybe, Grant, why don't you help us with this? Uh, well, the tattoos are the traditional image of Yakuza. And they do have tattoos, uh, but it's worth remembering that uh, not every Yakuza and not everyone working with the Yakuza has tattoos. So if you're looking for a tattoo to uh, find a Yakuza, you're probably going to miss it a lot of the time. All right, and let's. I, uh, we've got some other pictures of some tattoos I wanted to ask you about here. Um, uh, this one is a. a, a, a mixture of uh, uh, gentlemen that I assume are Yakuza and, and, and one of them would be wearing a suit. Is there any, is that a higher ranked individual typically when you, when you see something like this? Oh, I think it's just the event. Uh, he didn't have to strip, that's all. Uh, <laughs> all right, and uh, let's... And I was just gonna add that uh, typically uh, the Yakuza are not going to publicly display their tattoos. So what this is usually something that happens in a private setting. They may be gambling, playing poker, or whatever the case might be, but they're typically not going to be out in public with, with that kind of demonstration. They're going to keep them covered, and uh, only amongst themselves, by and large, will they show off their tattoos, which can be very extensive. That's right, and you actually find that um, it's, it's a huge problem these days because there is so much sensitivity to it, and you find Yakuza complaining they can't get into public baths, for example. Uh, that also affects Americans who come to Japan. It seems that most of them have tattoos, and, and so they, they, ca they cause a stir as well. What about <laughs> this picture that our audience is looking at now about a, a tattooed woman? Are women involved in the Yakuza in Japan? Uh, I've never heard of a, a, an actual Yakuza uh, Woman, but there are women certainly in that world. They serve a certain purpose, which you can probably guess. Mm -hmm. What about this next picture? This is kind of the the the, the, the classic uh, situation uh, in, involving the missing finger. What's that all about, Grant? Uh, well, to, if uh, Yakuza makes a mistake, he, to atone to his boss, he will slice off a, a joint. And if you make more mistakes, you slice off more joints. Um, obviously, this used to be a bit more common, but a lot of people don't, uh, they can't get, they can't go overseas, for example. Uh, they have trouble, they can't get jobs, they can't get houses or places to live in Japan if they have those fingers. So there's actually a certain amount of business in this sort of the restorative surgery. All right, well, let's hold on a second here now. Yeah, that and prosthesis. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, All All right. right. Let's, let's take a look <laughs> right. at, and uh, <laughs> folks, I want to warn you, this, for some of you, this, this may be a, a a little bit, uh, a little bit more violent than you're used to here. But let me let me just show you what this whole process of atonement looks like here, uh, with this next piece. Hey! 
there you have it. Let's go to the next picture now. Um, uh, and so we were talking right before this uh, uh, the video piece of prosthesis or repair. And so let's go back over that again. You, a Yakuza that cuts off a knuckle has problems traveling. Uh, traveling and also just getting on into in society today in Japan. It's gotten a lot harder in about the last 10 years for a Yakuza to uh, publicly identify himself. And if you're missing a finger, there's about a 99% chance uh, what you are. Well, have we, we've been looking at kind of, so far in the program, uh, Charlie and Grant, we've been looking at kind of the, 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 the classic uh, Yakuza that, that, that we see in motion pictures that everybody knows about. And so take a look at this next picture and, and uh, we'll, we'll look at some others here. Well, what's this one about? Uh, this is actually the, it's the, the president of a very popular, very well-known finance company in Japan a few years ago. Uh, he they had a very popular, very big company. Uh, they had a very uh, effective advertising campaign going on saying borrow from us. And they, very nice, it was very attractive. They had pretty little, pretty girls and cute little dog as their, uh, him, as their logo or symbol. Um, if you didn't repay them, you would have a very good chance of the Yakuza coming to collect. Um, he got, they got caught and that's what happened. He's bowing in uh, atonement. And the, the company was sanctioned, of course, but it was as much to send a message as anything else. So, but, but, so we're, we're showing and we're talking about now is the whole spectrum that goes from these tattooed guys all the way up to uh, into the legitimate or semi-legitimate business circles in, in Japan. That's right, all the way up to the highest end of the most sophisticated, uh, well-respected businesses you can think. And it is that spectrum that you describe. What, what, about, this, what about this picture? Oh, that's uh, two Citibank executives apologizing for having had Yakuza as clients and done business with them. Uh, this was in about 2004. Citibank got their private banking license pooled and, of course, promised not to do it again. Um, in 2009, they got caught doing it again. So you can actually find another picture on the Internet of them bowing one more time. <laughs> okay. Citibank. That's right. Okay. So we got this whole, whole, whole uh, range uh, back and forth. So, what, in in terms of the range, how, how does the how does the yakuza get people that are in legitimate business circles, university graduates, and so forth? Where, where do they where do they come from? How do they get these people that are that don't look like gangsters? Uh, it ultimately comes down to money in most cases, and particularly in the financial industry. If yakuza have huge amounts of money to invest, if a potential client comes with a lot of money, one is not inclined to ask a whole lot of questions. Uh, that's one aspect. And then the traditional human failings that open somebody up for blackmail. Uh, that offers another inroad, which Yakuza often make uh, good use of. But a lot of the cooperation is quite willing. Let's take a look at this next picture. Who is, who is this, if one of you can identify this guy? I cannot. Uh, that's the, uh, <laughs> it's the, uh, at the head of Yamaguchi Gumi, Japan's largest game. Uh, when he was getting out of prison. And so his, uh, the name he goes by is, is Scott Scassa. Uh, okay, and let's do this. Uh, let's, let's take a look at uh, uh, kind of a crime scene here, uh, the next, uh, next photograph here. Um, this is violence. Uh, it is. And uh, what is this all about? Uh, this is actually, it's happened some years back when the, the mayor of Nagasaki was murdered uh, by a uh, member of Japanese organized crime. Uh, there's some debate over what the actual motivations were, um, but it had something to do with a uh, with public works contracts not going where they should. Mm -hmm. Let's let's do this now. Let's let's move from this this whole focus on on uh, it's a little bit uh, abstract to the to the to our viewers. Let's get involved in in a business where it's something that that is almost a common place in many uh, homes here in Hawaii and, and, and in the American market. Uh, let's let's take a look at the next. Uh, next uh, picture here and um, I want to talk with both of you about the whole situation that involved Olympus and Olympus camera and so uh, uh, let's go to the next photograph after that and uh, uh, Grant, uh, Grant why don't you fill us in on what, what does this have to do with organized crime in Asia? 
Uh, you wouldn't think much. You know, I've, I once owned an Olympus camera, and it's got a good reputation. I've got one right now. It's the reason it strikes home. Uh, they, a few years ago, uh, Olympus um, hired a British man named Woodford as its chairman, or the president. Um, and after he got there, he discovered that they had that some questionable things were going on. That Olympus, for example, had paid about $700 million for buying the equivalent of a Tupperware company that had never made any money. Uh, and he 11 was, million. Uh, it's more like 700 million. It was a, okay. a lot of money. And he was actually being fed information, apparently, by somebody within Olympus who didn't like this. And one thing and led to another, and ultimate, after really quite a struggle between Woodford and the board and all sorts of things, uh, it was revealed that uh, the company had indeed um, been uh, spending money unwisely. Uh, unwisely. That's right. And it, 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 but this was never, and the short answer of this is the public, uh, the reporting on this suggested there was Yakuza involvement, but ultimately this was just hushed up. Uh, but what was going on was this was a, the Yakuza pulling money out of uh, Olympus for quite a while. But it is significant that the mainstream press in Japan never published this. They stayed away from it. The Western press, New York Times and a couple others, uh, did some uh, aggressive work. Um, and additionally, the Japanese government just eventually concluded uh, there were no Yakuza to be had in this. They punished the uh, officials, but ultimately they, they would, you would think it was leprechauns that were to blame for it. There was no Yakuza <laughs> to be seen here. Let's take a look at the next photo and talk a little bit about uh, the involvement of organized crime in Japan, the Yakuza, in politics. And so what are we looking at here? Those of us who've been to Tokyo have seen these sound trucks driving around, uh, particularly around election time. What is this all about? Goodness, well, this is called uh, the Uyoku, the the rightists, the right wing, and they are, uh, in some circles, they're known as very right, very conservative political action groups. Um, almost all of them do have a uh, yakuza connection, a yakuza backing, and it's they perform a variety of services to uh, try to intimidate and uh, bully people. Um, and they also go around complaining about the Russians and the Koreans and sometimes the Americans. Uh, but when you see that, it, you do have to associate them immediately with the Yakuza. That's the correct thing. Uh, one of the, the in funny stories that I once heard was a, a fellow I knew was actually invited to go ride on one uh, once for a day and you know, smoke the equivalent of 15 packs of cigarettes in about eight hours. But he gets on and they're sharing a cheesecake, piece of hmm. cheesecake. Okay. There's, um, couple Yakuza and two members of the Tokyo Metropolitan Police, uh, which tells you something about the connections there. So. What's this next picture? Uh, that would be the, the Yamaguchi Gumi uh, gang symbol. And it's quite public. It's, you know, everyone knows what that is. Uh, it's not hidden, whereas you would, and Charlie could tell you that the Italian mafia, we've never heard of the mafia. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this is really quite are well known. In fact, let's look at this next one. What, uh, this looks like a rice cracker to me. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> well, so five, five, six years ago when they had the change of command, they um, baked ceremony or commemorative You mean um, change, of command, change for of command the, for the Yamaguchi? That's right. For the, yeah. for the Yakuza. Uh, this was the, this yeah. says this is commemorating the change of command. All right, and, and what about this next photograph here that, uh, you know, we all know about sumo wrestling. Why is this this important for organized crime? <coughs> oh, it's, it's another example of how organized crime has really worked into the, the woodwork of uh, Japanese society. And sumo wrestling, of course, has had a long connection with the underworld. Uh, this came to light in a, a recent scandal of just a few years ago uh, when the, the Yakuza had actually hired, they uh, took most of the seats around the, the front row, one of the, the matches, because um, they knew they'd be on TV, and it said that it was to sort of tell the boss in prison that they were thinking of him. This was a step too far for the Japanese police and for the Japanese government. Let me show you one more picture of uh, uh, the two of you before we go to the break here. If we bring up this, this photograph of a young child here, and this is, a, this is a surprise to the two of you. I will represent to you that this is a, uh, a, uh, from a Gerber baby advertisement. 
uh, talking about tough little kids. And so they've got this, this little kid that's all got the uh, Yakuza-like uh, tattoos all over them. And uh, I, just, I just thought you, the two of you would enjoy seeing this, uh, this picture as, as, as <laughs> weaving the, the whole Yakuza uh, elements weaving its way into, uh, into American, American culture a little bit. Uh, not to make light or to make fun of uh, uh, what they do, but I thought thought the two of you in our audience might appreciate that. I hope that thing was photoshopped. I'm sure it was <laughs> photoshopped. That's I, I think most Japanese would look at that and they, they would say in Japanese, ah, kimochi warui. It means it's creepy, is yeah. what they would say. And that's probably the right yeah. I think it is right creepy. Reaction. It is very creepy. Yeah, right. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching uh, Think Tech Asia. We're broadcasting to you from downtown uh, Honolulu here at Pioneer Plaza. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Charlie Goodwin and uh, Grant Newsham here in the studio with us. We're talking about organized crime in the Asia Pacific, and we'll be back after this break. Hello, I'm Martin Despang, and I'm the host together with the one and only Ali Amashta, and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And urban transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Thank you very much. Ready? <laughs> ステーブル力団山口組6代目組長の um, and in which he was, he, he spoke at length, and one of the really telling things is he was asked about the effect of the, the Japanese government's uh, new anti-Yakuza ordinances that they had implemented. And he said, yeah, you know, I, he, what he said was, we'll adjust. And, we will adjust. And that's right. And that was very telling because the Yakuza are flexible, nimble, and uh, some of Japan's best entrepreneurs. All right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit, gentlemen, about the the uh, other roles that uh, focusing initially on Japan, on the Yakuza, other roles in society that they play. And uh, Charlie, have you got some kind of thoughts on this? What else do they do? Well, I mean, I'm thinking back through history. Um, if you talk about traditional organized crime in the United States um, versus the Yakuza today. Uh, here in Hawaii, for instance, um, I don't see a lot of violence associated with Yakuza here. Well, wait a minute. Think, are you saying the Yakuza is here in Hawaii? Oh, sure. Sure, they have interests here. Okay. In fact, um, Yakuza, in terms of the United States, they've had some limited influence in states like California and, and the West Coast and maybe even uh, some associations in New York and places like that. But their main interest in the United States, I think, would be fair to say it's here in Hawaii. Well, we'll come back to this. Yeah. Uh, what, what's, what's the organized crime component here in Hawaii a little, a little bit later in the show? Okay. Um, what other roles do they play in, in society in, in, in Japan that, that you've had experience with or observed? Well, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking me, but... Um, and, and, you know, really maybe Grant would be, since he's lived in Japan, he would be better equipped to answer that. But uh, they, Yakuza in Japan uh, play very much the same sort of role, first of all, as organized crime in the United States in trying okay. to influence politics and, and that sort of thing, but also controlling criminal interests there, whether it might be gambling, prostitution, drugs, uh, to a certain extent, uh, money laundering. Um, just a wide range of criminal activities, but also, uh, not only that, they also have a lot of legitimate interests as well. I mean, with your ill-gotten gains, you have to do something with the money that you earn. Right, right. So they end up, just as they have here in the United States, buying legitimate business, running legitimate business, 
And so we see that here in Hawaii as well as in Japan. Grant, can you uh, add to this, <coughs> this point about kind of the, 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 the role of the Yakuza in Japanese society? What else do they do other than this, this extensive mm -hmm. list that, that uh, Charlie has laid out, which is... Well, they do s several things. Um, certain Pablo politicians would, in general, in general, would look at Yakuza actually as almost a, sort of a support group or a political action committee where the Yakuza provide block votes, uh, they provide information with which to blackmail other people and to present, prevent yourself from getting blackmailed, um, and they provide money, and funding, and in return, traditionally, the Yakuza would get public works contracts, it sort of recycles itself. Uh, the, the origins of that actually go back to the Meiji era in the 19th century. Um, they play a dispute resolution role. I mean, oh, the lawyers will enjoy this. Well, Go ahead. Well, there's so few lawyers in Japan, but there's just as many disputes between <laughs> Japanese as there are anyone else. And the Yakuza actually play a role that lawyers would play in a lot of other places. Um, I heard once that in Kyushu, for example, that most companies of any scale would actually have a Yakuza on the, on the payroll in order to deal with problems with cu customers and other companies. Right, right. And there's a professor at University of Michigan, or he was a while back, Mark West, who actually did very uh, enlightening work on this. And the third thing I would note is that Yakuza actually play the role of Silicon Valley. What? Uh, th there's no venture capital business in Japan. Okay. Because uh, if someone has a good idea, needs to get funding, if he goes to a bank, they will tell him, well, the exit is over here, sir. And <laughs> so, but Japanese have just as many good ideas as anyone else. If you need funding, well, the Yakuza have a ton of money, and as I said, these guys are nimble entrepreneurs who can spot an opportunity. So they would actually be the guys who lend money to these starting people with ideas, the startup companies, the venture capital. All right, let's, let, let me jump on this idea because this is, this is, this is fascinating to me. Uh, is this venture capital investment work, the... the Yakuza Venture Capital Association, if you will, do they, do they invest in startups outside of Japan? I've never heard of that. Uh, I just don't know. You know I've not heard of it. So. Clearly, um, the Yakuza in Japan much more, is much more widely accepted and open uh, in their society than, for instance, traditional organized crime in the United States. They're almost a, if you will, a, a component, political component. That's not to say that in the United States, traditional organized crime doesn't try to influence politics, for instance, but they just don't do it uh, as openly as Yakuza because of the, uh, the, the regard in which they're held in this country, the mobs and syndicates and that sort of thing. Uh, but believe me, through labor unions uh, and, and racketeering, they definitely try to influence elections, politicians, and the full range that Yakuza does, traditional organized crime in the U.S. does as well. Let yes, me you, bring up, go ahead, Grant. Yes, Yakuza do have to be careful, and they don't, they're, they're, they don't <laughs> flaunt the, their, what they are when they, they are involved in the political end of it. Um, but it, you're right, it is very different than it is in the, um, uh, in the, in the United States. Um, also, the and when it is revealed, for example, that a politician does have yakuza ties, and somehow it just can't be hidden, or the press has to look at it, it does cause a fuss. And uh, under the Noda administration, which was the previous prime minister, the justice minister, about three weeks after he took office, it was discovered he was pretty good friends with a yakuza. This created a fuss, and he did have to step down. But but Charlie's right that it's nowhere near as hidden as it is in the United States. Well, one of the things that, that, that is, is interesting is that, and uh, let me ask the control room if you would, would, would queue up uh, uh, video 1B ready to go. And let me just say to the audience here while that's going on that, that you see uh, scenes in Japan uh, that, that underscore how open uh, the uh, Yakuza is as a part of society here. And so here's a scene that was, was uh, shot, and let's go ahead and roll this uh, piece, uh, where a, a major crime boss is arriving in his Rolls Royce there. Uh, uh, got a wonderful greeting, and we got a nice close-up shot uh, uh, of the gentleman there. Uh, but let's go on to the next photograph here, uh, number 16, if we could. Um, 
and uh, I'll represent to both of you that this is a shot uh, of casinos in Macau and I want to take the discussion that we've had so far about the Yakuza in Japan and then start to move to uh, a little higher elevation outside of Japan and uh, what's the connection if any that the Yakuza has with the whole gambling industry outside of the country like in Macau? Well, just first of all, uh, gambling has been a traditional part of Asian culture and of Asian organized crime. And, and the, uh, whether it's Chinese triads, uh, On Leong Tong, Hip Sing Tong, all the Tongs, uh, the Yakuza, or Boy Okadan, uh, gambling's a huge part of the culture. And, and we see that here in Hawaii. And we don't have any legal gambling here, but that's not to say that there isn't any gambling here. Uh, Las Vegas been a huge influence. You see all the people from uh, Hawaii make the, make the trek to Las Vegas. The, 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 the yeah. 11 o'clock Delta flight. Um, Las Vegas interests in Macau. Uh, you know, U.S. business right. is there in Macau as well. And uh, this is one of the areas in which uh, the, the Japanese organized crime, Chinese organized crime, uh, American organized crime to the extent that it's involved in gambling these days in Las Vegas uh, and uh, what else? Maybe uh, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, American, they all cooperate in the gambling industry, in the gaming industry. Yeah, you certainly see the businesses in intersect and th that's what you see in Vegas, uh, Macau. The, uh, in Macau the, there is certainly Yakuza interest there. Um, in fact, it's mm -hmm. um, one Yakuza who got involved there was able to get himself plugged in pretty well and it actually irritated other Yakuza because he was, he was being taken as a legitimate man. <laughs> it really <laughs> bothers them. And the Yakuza are involved in gambling in South Korea. Um, and finally, as you know, casinos are probably coming to Japan before too long. The momentum's built. And the question has always come, well, won't the Yakuza get into that? And of course, it's been, you know, everyone involved in this says, oh, of course not. We keep them out. We're going to do this and that. And a dear old friend of mine who was a very senior National Police Agency official who passed on about two months ago. In Japan. This is Japan. That's right. Yeah. You know, he, I was having breakfast with him once. He says, you know, the only people who can keep the Yakuza out of the Japanese casinos are the Yakuza. And you know they're not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's take a look at this yeah. next picture, uh, if we could. Uh, um, and talk about triads. Let's move from Yakuza to uh, organized crime elsewhere in the region here. Uh, uh, Chinese, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Um, that photograph that we just saw, uh, either of you recognize that? The symbol of such, I don't particularly Let's try one more time. We'll see one more time. Yeah. What do we got there? There are two triad symbols. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And let's go to the next picture after that. and. Uh, uh, I noticed some similarities, but differences in the tattoo styles. Uh, these are, are uh, I'll represent to you uh, photographs of, of uh, triads from some place yeah. in the region here. You know, um, tattoos amongst uh, whether it's Yakuza, the triads, the uh, Aryan nations, uh, you know, prison tattoo type things, they're pretty much an earmark of organized crime. Not so much with the uh, Sicilian and Italian organized crime families. They're, they were never really into tattoos. But the new, and I, I don't mean to represent that the triads and the, uh, the Yakuza are startup because they've been around <laughs> for a long, long time before U.S. organized crime or, or any of them were involved. But the, the uh, for instance, with the Yakuza, and I assume with the triads as well, the tattoos are in a way a symbol of art for them. It's a passage for them because they're not done like tattoos are today with uh, electric needles and that sort of thing. A lot of them are done with uh, pretty significant body piercing and ink injected uh, with bamboo or, or uh, needles and that sort of so thing. So but severe discomfort yeah, involved. Yeah, it's, it's a painful, long, expensive process for them. So it's it's kind of a symbol of uh, of their standing. Let's try another triad uh, a photograph here, number 18, if we could. Uh. I, I'd also mention that they're also, as with gangs today, uh, they're a good way, as Grant had mentioned in Japan, they, they cover them, but it's a good way to identify uh, various gang members and organized crime members. And so 
Here in the U.S., when they're arrested, gang members, their tattoos are routinely photographed. I don't know if uh, the police authorities in Japan really keep track of the uh, tattoos or not. No, it's, not like the U.S. Yeah, probably. It's pretty much a prima facie <laughs> case that you're Yakuza if you have a tattoo in Japan. And it's, uh, the, the artwork is so elaborate and so unique that uh, these are individualists, I suppose. I've got one for you here. Let's look at the next yeah. photograph. Look at this. This is a, a, a oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's change topics here. Let's, let let's me talk show about counterfeiting. No, yeah, no. let's talk about <laughs> counterfeiting. Here, let's bring up the next photograph here. Good old Marlboro cigarettes. All right, and so counterfeiting, whether it's cigarettes, money, or other items, uh, what's the involvement of organized crime in Asia in, in, in this topic? Grant, you have some thoughts on that? Well, it, it's, uh, there's money to be made. There's a lot of money to be made. And also, the, the downside risk is very low. The upside risk is very high. So that's very different than dealing in drugs. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody, if you get caught with counterfeit cigarettes, it's not the same as, a, say, a container load of heroin. Uh, but it is an, the significance of the Marlboros is that it is an immense money maker uh, in Asia for particularly a lot of this comes out of North Korea and China and moves all over the world, uh, particularly Europe, Middle East, everywhere, United States, everywhere. And it is, a, it, it, it is an excellent case study of the uh, sort of the multinational, very sophisticated reach of organized crime. And also, this could not exist without the involvement of uh, officials, uh, governments, and law enforcement, and even militaries to protect it. Uh, and also uh, very sophisticated uh, banking services that are on offer somewhere. All tied together. That's right. When I think of counterfeiting, the first thing I think of is China. And we, we see just huge amounts of goods coming out of China that are counterfeit. And, and actually a lot, since we do have so much production in, in China of high-end goods, it, it does, it's not a stretch for people who work in that industry and, for instance, produce the Louis Vuitton handbag. Louis Vuitton for Louis Vuitton legitimately in the back door or coming out the back door, they're producing the same thing on the counterfeit market. And maybe some of the, uh, the materials are a little bit substandard or maybe they're not paying the same price, but you see it across, across the board in all sorts of goods. And as Grant points out, the most likely thing you're going to have happen because of the low prosecutive interest here in this country is it's going to be confiscated. Uh, we don't see very many prosecutions for counterfeit goods. On the other hand, uh, you know, North Korea has worked uh, in counterfeiting currency in an attempt, arguably, to destabilize economies, production of counterfeit $100 bills of extremely high quality because it's state-sponsored, you know, uh, and, they, and they are able to obtain the paper and the engraving techniques to make the kind of quality uh, counterfeit bills that, that it cause a real problem. And, 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 and because of that expertise <clears throat> in counterfeiting, that is, is it not one of the reasons why some of our, our, our recent Treasury notes that have been issued, mm -hmm. people, folks, you'll notice that the ink is Ink has changed; they're a lot more colorful, and that's that's to directly exactly. aimed at the North exactly. Koreans. Exactly. Yeah. What's the uh, What's the connection in uh, let's 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 use China and North Korea as an example between uh, the the organized crime gangs triads and the government? Are are, are they operating in sync? Well, to an extent, they couldn't operate without some form of sponsorship or support of the government, whether it's through corruption and, and corrupting government officials, uh, whatever the case might be, as Grant mentioned, moving, moving products across borders, uh, it's very difficult to do without some involvement of the state. You know, I heard a, read a quote uh, not long ago by a <coughs> fellow named David Asher, who was the Treasury official uh, who was behind the very successful Macau bank sanctions, which made the North Koreans scream. And he said about North Korea, says there's no organized crime in North Korea because the government is organized it, crime. It's a got an organized enterprise and, in and itself. And that is yeah. not a glib statement. That's how it yeah, is. And it when is. you get into China, uh, I've had others who know the area very well, they, they say 
organized crime and the government are basically one and the same. The same. Uh, you have to, there's a little more distance in some cases in China than in North Korea, which is a purely criminal enterprise. But in uh, China, you do have a, just a, a very deep uh, connection uh, if you go up far enough. Well, we're going to go up far enough after we take a break. And then when we, so we'll, when we come back from the break, we want to explore a little bit more about the, the criminal connection. I want to uh, talk about Bo Xi Lai just a little bit. And then for the balance of the show, when we come back after the break, let's, let's zero in here in Hawaii and, and, and look at the involvement of some of the Asian uh, organized crime groups here in Hawaii, as well as some of our local groups and how they all fit together here. I think, I think ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll find this most interesting. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Hi, my name is Dr. Rafi. Every week, I'm right here at Think Tank Hawaii, 3 p.m. on Mondays. My show is Bard's Bio Biobriefings. What do we do here? Well, we watch sperm swim. We see if they catch anybody. We check out the latest biosimilars. You know, the kind that, uh, what was his name? The guy with the bicycle? Uh, I guess we forgot his name, but he was taking EPO and other human growth factors. We'll be talking about human growth factors. You want to know where to get some? Maybe I'll tell. Anyway, you can catch me, as I said, every week right here, Monday, 3 p.m., Think Tech Hawaii, Dr. Rafi. You can also find me on Twitter, BioInfo Medical. Or you can catch me on Facebook, Dr. Rafael Boritzer. I'll be happy to converse with you. Aloha. We're back. You're watching Think Tech Asia. We're talking about organized crime in the Asia Pacific, and our guests uh, for this extraordinary program this afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Charlie Goodwin, the former special agent in charge of the FBI here in uh, Honolulu, and Mr. Grant Newsham, a former U.S. diplomat with the embassy, our embassy in uh, in Tokyo. Um, right at the break, we were talking about. Uh, following organized crime up the uh, triads, up the, up the chain, if you will, uh, in, in China. And uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, next I want to show you a photograph of uh, Bo Xi Lai, the recent uh, member of the Politburo that, that fell from grace. There was a, a trial, as you recall. Uh, and so we could see that photo next. Uh, all right. What do we have here? We have a, a former, former mayor of major city in western China that cracked down on corruption, uh, brought some justice officials uh, in, uh, um, but uh, he himself brought up on rather light charges of, of, of corruption in terms of money taken. What's your take on this thing, Grant? Um. I don't think it, it indicates a sea change in attitudes towards <laughs> corruption in China. Uh, it strikes me as one gang moving in to take over another one. Uh, the, uh, the Chinese have been um, shooting people every year for years to try and get a handle on corruption. And it just it seems to have no effect at all. Uh, one notices the, uh, the crackdown on New York Times and Bloomberg when they reported on the fabulous wealth of certain Chinese leaders. I just don't see this as a, say, a sea change. Others may differ, but I don't see it. Charlie, what about you? Any, any uh, thoughts? Probably, on? again, like window dressing. Um, I don't think there is, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, the Department of Justice, the FBI, uh, major city police departments have always, they've had an interest in stamping out organized crime. Uh, and their involvement in the rackets, uh, racketeering, uh, extortion, bribery, uh, all of those things, the public corruption. I don't sense that that's uh, a high priority. We, we've po pointed out and spoken about how government and organized crime in China, Japan, Korea uh, kind of intertwines and is, it's not really thought of as really organized crime as much as it is an organization that can be helpful and get things done. And we, and we in the United States don't see organized crime in that light, largely because of the history of organized crime here. It's never been a, of a particular benefit here in this country. Although arguably, you know, at the turn of the century during prohibition and that sort of thing, 
And, and clearly today, organized crime continues to play a big role in the economy, even in, in the United States. If you look at the labor unions uh, and, and that sort of thing, particularly in cities like New York, uh, Boston, Chicago, huge right. influence on politics and the economy in those places. Yeah, and one notes that in a country like China, for example, <coughs> where the, you don't have rule of law, you don't have property rights, you don't have investigative press or really anyone who digs into right. Uh, corruption on public behalf. It just comes out by random or in one faction going after another one. It's very hard to really get a handle on assuming anyone wanted to. I was going to say that uh, there's really not the will uh, there to change it, that. Not, People are getting you know, what they want from who they want. Um, it, the, it is a, there's a smash and grab mentality as well with <laughs> both the triads and in China. And it, smash and grab. Yeah. It's <laughs> to get what you can, get well, it out of the country yeah. somewhere yeah. safe. And is that someone from Boston said after um, the latest public scandal appeared in Boston. He says, it's the culture. It's the culture. And that's pretty okay. much what it is, as I see it. All right, well, let's, let's focus now on the situation uh, here in Hawaii. And uh, so, Grant, I'm going to go to you first, and then we'll come, come back to, to, to Charlie with his FBI experience. And so my question to you, Grant, is, you know, references have been made throughout this show about uh, <clears throat> Yakuza involvement here in, in, uh, in Hawaii. And so what have we got? Uh, you know, it's, Hawaii is still a great place uh, to be, to live. It's, um, there's, so it's pretty safe. But you could walk from, I could, I could walk from downtown Honolulu and I would start off here and I would see a company, a Yakuza <coughs> dominated company that could get me from point A to point B if I wanted. I could walk a little farther and I might uh, buy some stuff. I could stop off at a particular store that sells a lot of things I might need that is considered owned by a Yakuza frontman. I could keep going a little farther, uh, say down to Be Hungry by the time I got to Waikiki. Okay. There's a restaurant I could stop at that is Yakuza owned. Um, I may go stop and watch a little porn in the porno shops, and that's Yakuza. I could, um, used to be, I, if I got tired by then, I could have stayed in a couple of the prominent hotels in Waikiki. The Yakuza pretty much lost their shirts on those investments. And I could keep going, and I would eventually get to where it's a very good neighborhood, I could get to a place where a guy bought a whole lot of houses not too long ago, and uh, some would say he was uh, not unacquainted with the Yakuza. So you can, the Yakuza definitely are here, and most of these things are very legitimate uh, businesses. What's your take now, on as, Yakuza here? As, he, as Grant just pointed out, a lot of their interests here are in legitimate businesses. What I've always uh, uh, seen is their interest in gambling. And, and the okay. gambling business here in Hawaii. That, along with uh, the, the uh, prostitution, potential uh, human trafficking, and pornography. So when we talk about strictly their illegitimate interests, uh, that is what I would uh, envision as being their primary uh, interest. We have triads I, I otherwise don't see them in here engaging for instance, in a lot of violent activity okay. or anything okay. of that nature. We, we, we were very fortunate here in Hawaii that, by and large, we have a pretty low violent crime rate. On the other hand, we have a lot of thievery. And uh, gambling and thievery and property issues are things that, throughout history, uh, both triads and Yakuza have been involved in. So do we have triads here? Um, Presence? <sighs> I have, I have uh, in my experience, have not taken a lot of interest in worrying about the triads. I, we have had, I know during my time with the FBI, uh, information on triads or uh, tongs that, that are here, operate in Chinatown, again, primarily in the gaming and gambling industries. Not, and, and probably some degree of loan sharking or trafficking in loans and that sort of thing, but not the vi kind of violence uh, and extortive activity that you would associate with traditional organized crime. Grant, what's your take? Triad presence um, here? Which is, you find is, I'd be surprised if there wasn't. I'd be surprised, and there's probably Vietnamese organized crime as a possibility too. Uh, yeah. You do find with the triads and Asian organized crimes, wherever there are, wherever Chinese people go anywhere on earth, the triads follow them. And these guys are rapacious parasites. I mean, they make the Yakuza look nice. Really? Uh, by comparison. Uh, more violent? 
uh, that's my impression of them. They uh, say there is a difference uh, for whatever reason. The, the typical yakuza is supposed to behave by a certain code. set of rules. Yeah, code. Uh, they do sometimes, and in, but in general, there's a sort of almost a, an underworld gravitas to a lot of yakuza. Of course, they can disappear pretty quickly, and these are violent people. But compared to the triads, uh, and I won't even say who else because they scare me too much. But they compared to the triads, the yakuza actually uh, are not not nearly as violent. But you would think too that uh, from time to time, yakuza would use as enforcers people from triads and from other organized crime groups. They've as done well. that in Japan. There have yeah. been some uh, murders that have been done with effectively Chinese hitmen. Uh, that's uh, been more than a few of those. What about the, what about the Russian mafia? Are they here in Hawaii? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we, we are seeing, I know in years past, throughout the United States and not just here in Hawaii, an influx of Russians. Uh, and just like with uh, the Chinese, if there are Russians, then there's Russian organized crime following. And they're particularly good at uh, some of the higher tech crimes and that sort of thing, whether it's scams, uh, um, uh, other money laundering schemes, whatever it might be. They also can be very violent. Um, the mainland cities uh, that have experienced and have have uh, Russian organized crime, uh, or any of the Eastern Bloc countries that that are gangs involved in organized crime, and we have seen Russians here. Um, in, I, I, in I guess somebody out there in the audience wants to know: Do, do we have presence of the Mexican cartels here? Um, we we here in Hawaii, a lot of our methamphetamine is trafficked here through California, Mexico, the West Coast. Um, and there have, from time to time, been uh, Mexican gang members here in Hawaii. Uh, as near as I can tell and know at this point in time, they've never really gained a foothold here, but they will traffic out here. They have had a presence here. And fortunately, we have not seen the kind of violence that is associated with the Mexican cartels and the gangs here, uh, or the Colombians either. Th there is a presence, but it's fortunately at this point not a violent presence. But methamphetamine is a problem here in the islands. All right. Last word to you on this broad topic, Grant. What? Anything you want to add before we, we run out of time here? Uh, hmm. Just one thing, looking at it over some period of years, say take 20 years, uh, there's a huge sort of racket that has grown up with anti-money laundering and uh, with government officials, academics, who all make a name for themselves on ways to get rid of organized <coughs> crime. Looking at it over a 20-year period, I don't think anything's changed. <laughs> I just don't. Th mm -hmm. I think there's as much organized crime as there's ever been. And as long as there's human beings, you're probably going to still have it. Well, we're about out of time. And uh, Charlie Goodwin, thank you so much. Grant Newsham, it's wonderful to have you again, and thank you both. Uh, this has been a, been a fascinating show. Um, join us next week, same time, same place. Uh, we'll have uh, Michael Sikarski with us, and we'll be talking about some of the cultural miscues that Americans miss in negotiating and dealing with the Chinese that have caused some very serious problems, not only from a national security standpoint, but also in business. I'm David Day. I'm your host. I'll see you again next week. Have a safe drive home.